Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is James M. McPherson, who is the George Henry Davis 08 Professor of History Emeritus at Princeton University. He is the best-selling author of numerous books on the Civil War, including Battle Cry of Freedom, which won the Pulitzer Prize. His new book is Tried by War, Abraham Lincoln as Commander in Chief. Professor McPherson, welcome to Berkeley. Well, thank you. Where were you born and raised? I was actually born in North Dakota. Uh -huh. uh, I lived there till I was six years old, and then my family moved to Minnesota, and I grew up in Minnesota. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, my parents were uh, the first generation college graduates uh, in their families, and they always placed a high premium on education. Um, and so I was brought up in a family that valued education and even though this was small town America in the Midwest, I think that they encouraged me to have broader horizons than that. Uh, was there talk of history around the dinner table or did you, you get the history bug a, as a student? Well, curiously enough, I didn't, unless it was subconsciously being absorbed, which I don't recall, uh, I didn't have that much interest uh, in history in any particular way when I was uh, growing up. Uh, I had the usual small town public school, uh, high school experience where I was more interested in sports and I played in the band and so on than, than uh, in academics. So it wasn't really until I went to a college, a small liberal arts college in Minnesota, Gustavus Adolphus College, that I uh, got turned on to history by a couple of professors mm -hmm. there. And uh, uh, what history interested you? I mean, had you begun your interest in the Civil War yet? Or? In college, uh, my interests in history were fairly eclectic. Uh, one of the professors who really got me interested in the subject was not even an historian of the United States. He was an historian of Europe, and so it was European history courses. Uh, the principal courses in American history were in 20th century and the history of American foreign policy that I took. And so it wasn't really my college experience that got me interested in the Civil War, but rather my graduate school experience. Uh, growing up in Minnesota, I had didn't, I'd never visited the South, didn't really know that much about the South, but was fascinated and a little bit horrified by the South of the late 1950s. Uh, the years of the crisis over school integration at Little Rock, uh, federal troops being sent into Little Rock to enforce the rights of black students to attend that high school, Little Rock Central High School. And so I decided I needed to know more about the South, and I went to Johns Hopkins, who had the foremost historian of the American South at that time, C. Van Woodward, uh, for my graduate study. And I was there during the years of the Civil Rights Movement, and it was really that that got me interested in the Civil War. It also happened to be the early years of the Civil War centennial, but uh, that wasn't what really got me interested in the Civil War. It was the parallels between the time and place I was living in uh, and the events of exactly 100 years earlier in the 1860s. A confrontation between the United States government and southern political leaders that were vowing massive resistance to national law, federal troops being sent into the South, Martin Luther King trying to get President John F. Kennedy to issue a new Emancipation Proclamation on the 100th anniversary of the original. Uh, Kennedy didn't, so King and others organized the March on Washington, which took place where? In front of the Lincoln Memorial. Mm -hmm. And in fact, King in his famous I Have a Dream speech invoked Lincoln. So I got very interested in uh, the civil rights activists of the 1860s, hmm. the abolitionists, both black and white, and the parallels between that era and my own era. And so I did my doctor dissertation, which became my first book on the abolitionists. Once slavery was abolished, what did they envisage as the next step in race relations? And, and once you finished that work, was it, it was just 
kind of a natural movement into to really exploring all aspects of the Civil War? It was. It was a natural step-by-step movement. I was originally interested in these radicals of the 1860s. Uh, and they were very critical initially of Lincoln because they saw him moving too slowly toward making this a war to abolish slavery and not merely a war to preserve the old Union. Uh, but the more I studied the, the um, achievement of their aims, the more I realized that what they were trying to accomplish uh, depended on the larger political context of the 1860s and Reconstruction as well as the war. And in turn, that larger political process was dependent on the military context. Uh, emancipation, the abolition of slavery, was quite literally accomplished at the bar- by the barrel of a gun. Mm-hmm. So I expanded my interest from the kind of, this kind of specific focus on this set of reformers and their ideologies to the larger political context, which of course included Lincoln preeminently, uh, to the uh, to the whole military course of the war, and for that matter, Reconstruction, because Reconstruction was also enforced by the presence of the United States Army in the South. Mm-hmm. Uh, your new book, and I will show it again, Tried uh, by War, Abraham Lincoln uh, as Commander-in-Chief. Uh, why did you write this book? Well, the simple answer is that a, an editor and a publisher approached me about <laughs> writing this book. Um, but that's only part of the answer. I've long been fascinated with Lincoln, uh, and I also have become increasingly convinced that almost everything that happened in the course of the Civil War, and that means in the course of American history since the Civil War, uh, can be traced back to Lincoln's leadership. We would be a much different country today, and maybe not just one country today, had it not been for the outcome of the Civil War, and the outcome of the Civil War uh, was heavily dependent on Lincoln's leadership. And so what I wanted to do was to look at what um, was really Lincoln's central preoccupation during the Civil War, and that is his role as Commander-in-Chief. And I think that that has been an understudied Mm -hmm. aspect of uh, Lincoln's presidency or of Lincoln's life. Uh, We know a lot about Lincoln's rise from log cabin to the presidency. We know a lot about his his, his political leadership uh, in the founding of the Republican Party in, in Illinois and, in, and nationally. We know a lot about his uh, election in 1860. We know quite a bit about different aspects of his personality. Uh, we know about his relationship with his cabinet, his relationship with Congress, and so on. But Lincoln himself spent more time and energy, I think, in the, the, um, in the role of, of commander-in-chief, that is, running the war mm-hmm. and defining the purpose of the war, uh, than he did in, in any, anything else. And I think he spent more time in the War Department Telegraph Office right next door to the White House mm-hmm. in Washington than he did anywhere else except the White House. Mm-hmm. So I thought that um, understanding more about Lincoln's role as commander-in-chief, how he carried that out, how, how, he, how he defined it, how he really created the modern, uh, the modern concept of commander-in-chief uh, would be an important uh, contribution to understanding the Civil War. Uh, as one reads uh, your book, and of course we can't do justice to it in an hour uh, interview, uh, one, what stands out is how impressive Lincoln was as an all-around leader before we talk about him as, you know, commander-in-chief. Uh, and uh, I want to talk a little about that. And, and one thing that is quite striking is his ability to see the complexity of the situations with which he was confronted. And by that I mean not just a particular military engagement, but rather all of the levels of politics and strategy uh, that were involved in the decisions that he had to make. Yes, and I think that the first thing you need to understand about Lincoln is that he was preeminently a politician. Uh, From the time he was 23 years old, when he first ran for the Illinois legislature, until he became president of the United States, uh, politics was not merely an avocation. Uh, It was uh, a a vocation. I mean, he made his living as a lawyer. 
but I think he served uh, four terms, eight years in the Illinois legislature, a term in Congress. He ran for the Senate from Illinois twice, was defeated. Uh, he became a, a, a leader in Illinois politics and then the President of the United States. So he put everything into a larger political context. And since the Civil War really had its roots uh, in the polarized politics of the 1850s, uh, he, as a politician, as an experienced politician, I think was in a position to see how all of these things related to the uh, the political crisis of what we might call the, the political crisis of the 1850s and 1860s, the bigger picture. It was more, war, as uh, Georges Clemenceau, the uh, French prime minister in World War I put it, uh, war is too important to be left to the generals. Mm -hmm. And I think this was a sentiment with which Lincoln could agree. Uh, he w had the bigger picture in mind of which the military aspects of the war were only a part. Mm -hmm. and, and Lincoln uh, uh, was uh, a person who, throughout this whole career was a learner. If, if he didn't know something, he would teach him himself. You tell the story of, of his, his family life when he was much younger and, and how he addressed a problem when he didn't understand what the conversation was about. He, he once told uh, somebody who was talking to him about his, um, his uh, impressive ability to get at the core of a problem that when he was a boy uh, and his father would have other adults over and they would talk about something uh, and he couldn't really understand what they, they were talking about. He, he was very frustrated and he would go to his room, this was I suppose when he was eight or ten years old, and he would pace back and forth and, and try to f understand what it was they were talking about and it wasn't until he could really figure this out that he felt, uh, that he felt like he um, had achieved anything and so that sense of um, of wanting to understand uh, and a determination to get at the at the at the at the uh, core of any problem uh, goes back to his childhood, and I think it was a secret of his uh, of his leadership. Mm -hmm. He he uh, wanted to penetrate to the core of any issue, and he turned out to be very successful at it. He was he was superb with um, juries as a lawyer. Uh, and I think he was superb with juries because uh, he could put aside uh, extraneous and irrelevant things and get at the core of a problem and, and make a jury see it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the irony of ironies is he really had once said in the Congress that he really didn't know much about wars in the military. Right. He had served in the military, but he didn't bring a body of experience to this. Well, new he, he made light of his own military experience back in 1830 when the Black Hawk War broke out in Illinois, when the Black Hawk Indians tried to come back to their ancestral homeland, he, like many others, enlisted in the militia. I was actually elected captain uh, of this militia unit, but this militia unit saw no action in the war, and later on when he was in Congress, which was during the Mexican War, a war that Lincoln opposed, uh, he gave a speech on the floor of the House in which he mocked his own mil military career, uh, said that he had uh, participated in a good many wild, a good many wild charges upon the, uh, the the wild onions and a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes, <laughs> but he never saw an enemy. Uh, so clearly, he had no relevant military experience, and in fact, in the only war the United States had fought up until the Civil War during his lifetime, he had been opposed to American policy. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very important, I think, to emphasize that uh, uh, he was a war president from almost day one of his presidency until the very end. So, uh, uh, one point. But then the, the the second point that I think we need to emphasize is the particular kind of war this was, namely a civil war, you know, in the homeland, so mm -hmm. to speak. Talk a little about that because that seems to be so much a part of uh, the politics of the war, which he was so insightful about throughout the conflict. 
Well, it is quite true that Lincoln was the only president in our history whose entire presidency was uh, occupied by war. We've had plenty of other presidents who were presidents during war, but part of their presidency also took place during peacetime, not with Lincoln. The first thing that crossed his desk the day after his inauguration was a message from Major Robert Anderson at Fort Sumter that the America, that the um, garrison of about 90 soldiers uh, only had enough supplies to hold out for a few more weeks. So Lincoln, on his very first day in office, was presented with a crucial decision uh, of whether to pull those troops out in response to the demand from the um, uh, South Carolina Confederate state government, backed up by the new Confederate States of America government, or whether to maintain those soldiers there as a symbol of um, the sovereignty of the United States over all of all of its um, all, all of its states and all of its facilities, like Fort Sumter, and that consumed the first six weeks of Lincoln's presidency. Hmm. Uh, so right off the bat, he had to make decisions. Uh, th that uh, our decision made by commander-in-chief in wartime, even though the war had not yet broken out, the decision he made would determine the question of peace and war. Uh, and he came up with a brilliant solution of notifying the Confederates that he was going to send in supplies, mm -hmm. but not send in reinforcements unless they tried to interfere. Uh, with the resupplying of these troops in a fort that was flying the American flag. That shifted the burden of deciding whether uh, peace or war uh, onto Jefferson Davis's shoulders. He ha did not hesitate at all. He ordered his military commander in Charleston, General Beauregard, uh, to fire on Fort Sumter and, and capture it uh, before the resupply ships could even get there. That only, not only started the American Civil War, but started in such a way that the Confederates uh, had to bear the burden of having fired the first shot and therefore uh, were the aggressor, which united a previously divided North and in fact uh, had the same kind of effect, I think, on the American people. Uh, that is defining the, the loyal states of the United States as the American people, that the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor had in 1941. Uh, it united a divided people. And this was entirely a political decision on Lincoln's part with important military consequences. And that set the pattern, I think, for his conception of and exercise of the role of commander in chief. And it is quite true that this is a war within the boundaries of what Lincoln considered to be the United States. The um, basis on which the United States fought that war was that secession was unconstitutional, illegal, illegitimate, and that these 11 states that constitute the Confederate States of America were, um, were rebellious, that this was a rebellion uh, and not a foreign war. Uh, of course, as it went on, it took on some of the characteristics of a foreign war. Uh, prisoners of war were not executed. They were treated as prisoners of war. That's typical of a foreign war. They were, when uh, the United States forces captured uh, Confederate soldiers or Confederate sailors, they didn't execute them as, uh, as uh, traitors or as pirates. They treated them as prisoners of war. Uh, and Lincoln declared a blockade of the southern coast, which is uh, an act of, of war. So the American Civil War was this curious combination of a domestic rebellion uh, with some characteristics of a foreign war. Uh, and I think Lincoln was able skillfully to juggle uh, these two things in such a way as to um, uh, is to maintain a kind of consistent policy on the part of the North that denied the theoretical legitimacy of the Confederacy, but at the same time recognized the reality uh, that, these, uh, that, that the Confederate government did in fact constitute a, a separate nation with an army, with a government, mm -hmm. with a treasury, uh, with a navy, and so on. So uh, this, is, this is one example, I think, of, of Lincoln's ability to uh, to, to solve uh, what might appear to be a kind of um, 
paradox mm -hmm. uh, of an internal rebellion that had some characteristics of a foreign war. And, and it, it's important to emphasize, as you do in the book, that he had his eye on the prize, and the prize was, you know, the restoration of, of one United States of America. And, and so as a result, often he had to look at a particular military situation uh, with an eye on building the coalition that would keep the war going and end up with uh, one union. So, so he had to worry about keeping uh, the the border states that were, you know, on the on the edge and could be brought over to the union side. Uh, that's quite true. And the issue on which he had to tr to walk this tightrope was the issue of slavery. Um, Lincoln had been elected by a majority of the northern voters, but not by a majority of all voters. Uh, and in order to, the Republican Party had been strong enough to win the election in 1860, but was not strong enough to fight a war on its own. And so Lincoln uh, needed the crucial support of northern Democrats as part of this coalition for the, uh, to prosecute this war for the Union. Uh, and he also needed the border slave states uh, that had not seceded, but had large minorities of their population that were pro-Confederate and might possibly secede. And the most important states were Kentucky, Maryland, and Missouri. Uh, so the slavery issue became a kind of test case. Lincoln was under a lot of pressure from radicals in his own party uh, to move against slavery. The slave power, they said, had brought on this war. Uh, slavery was essential to the Confederate economy and to the logistics of Confederate armies. So strike against slavery. And Lincoln said, uh, can't do that because if I do, the Northern Democrats and the border state uh, unionists will bail out of this war. Uh, Kentucky will be forced into secession. Maryland might be forced into secession. Missouri might be forced into secession. All of these three states were teetering on the edge. And as he said in September 1861, if they leave, the job on our hands is too big for us. Um, and so in the first year of the war, he had to uh, um, make it clear in order to maintain his war co coalition that this was a war only for the restoration of union. This is not a war uh, to abolish slavery. But as time went on, more and more Northerners, including Lincoln himself, uh, moved in a kind of step-by-step, -step, gradual, fitful, uh, back and forth way toward the conviction that in fact, in order to win this war, against uh, a nation that was based on slavery and fighting for slavery, the North was going to have to strike against slavery. Uh, and so the key part uh, of Lincoln's decision-making process on uh, what I call in the book national strategy, how do you mobilize maximum support for this war effort and how do you weaken the enemy, uh, moved toward striking against slavery. By the summer of 1862, he had made the decision that uh, that the balance of forces uh, would actually, uh, to, 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 to preserve the Union, would actually be strengthened by striking against slavery. Uh, for one thing, a lot of slaves were already coming into Union uh, military lines in states like Virginia and Maryland and uh, Kentucky. Uh, Tennessee, uh, where Union forces had, had already invaded. What are you going to do with these people? Are you going to send them back to slavery? Uh, no, uh, the Lincoln administration made the decision early on that they were not. And it became increasingly clear that if you could encourage more slaves to escape uh, and try to achieve freedom, uh, that you're going to weaken the Confederacy and you are going to uh, add the potential manpower of these slaves to your own side. So by 1862, Lincoln had made the decision uh, that if he used his war powers, and he was the first president to use the phrase war powers as commander in chief to seize enemy property being used to wage war against the United States, the slaves, uh, that he had the legal power to do that and that this would actually strengthen the Northern cause. So one of the, one of the key themes in my book uh, on, the, on this issue of, of national strategy is the shift, uh, Lincoln's shift, which um, 
paralleled and, and led a shift in northern opinion on this various issue, uh, on this very issue, from uh, a war merely to restore the Union to a war whose primary purpose was to restore the Union, but in which the uh, striking against slavery would aid the cause of restoring the Union is a key part of the story of the first half of the war and the first, the first half of Lincoln's leadership as commander in chief. The, this, uh, uh, the subtlety, the insight that uh, uh, Lincoln showed as leader leads you to, to, to throughout the book to, to really show us how he understood all aspects of the notion of commander-in-chief. So being commander-in-chief meant a national policy, it meant a national strategy, it meant a military strategy, it involved operations on the ground and tactics on the ground. Talk a little about that because we're, we're as we talk and in the book, you, you sort of are making us understand sort of really the many layers that he had to operate on. Lincoln really had to invent uh, the role of commander-in-chief. The Constitution merely says that the president shall be commander-in-chief of the army and navy and of the militia of the various states when called into federal service, period. It does not define the powers of the commander-in-chief. And uh, the precedents really didn't define those powers very much either when Lincoln had come into office. The United States had fought two large, uh, two major wars, the War of 1812 and the Mexican-American War, uh, but the presidents in both cases uh, had pretty much left the fighting of those wars to the military commanders in the field. Um, so when Lincoln came into office, uh, there wasn't much of the way of precedent for him to draw on. And so he basically created the, the function of commander-in-chief. Uh, he, in his first message to Congress on July 4, 1861, he used the phrase war power twice. And on various occasions he said that the, the Constitution gives me as commander-in-chief the uh, power and the responsibility to do whatever is necessary to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, which is the oath I took when I was in office. So whatever I do, uh, as commander-in-chief is, uh, is directed toward fulfilling that oath of office. And so he uh, undertook a number of actions. Uh, he proclaimed a blockade. Uh, he suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, by executive order, he increased the size of the, of the regular United States Army and Navy and also called out three-year volunteers, all in the name of uh, winning this war in order to fulfill his constitutional duties as commander-in-chief and as president to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. So he had a very expansive um, uh, uh, vision of his powers as commander-in-chief, and that eventually extended in 1862 uh, to his right to issue an Emancipation Proclamation, and also at almost the same date that he issued a preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, September 1862, uh, he declared martial law uh, in the entire country and created uh, military tribunals to try civilians uh, if they were uh, undermining the Union war effort. So uh, almost every power that has been claimed by subsequent presidents in wartime had actually been pioneered by Lincoln during the Civil War. And, and he was responding to, on the one hand, military necessity, but also, I guess one would have to say, the political necessity of moving toward this larger national goal, which was to keep the Union intact. Yeah, uh, Lincoln's critics would say that his conception uh, of his powers as commander-in-chief was that the end justified the means. Uh, and he might well have agreed with that. That is, the end was to preserve the United States as one nation. And therefore, any means that were efficacious in doing that were justified. Now, uh, Lincoln himself said on more than one occasion during the war that there were certain means that would not be justified. You could not kill civilians. Um, uh, 
without any authority of law. Uh, he also said that whatever actions he took during the Civil War in this greatest crisis, which actually threatened the very existence of the United States, would not necessarily constitute a precedent for presidential powers in, in, in uh, peacetime or even in a future war where the actual existence of the United States was not at stake. Uh, so presidents since Lincoln who have actually invoked his actions as a precedent ju that justified their actions, suspending the writ of habeas corpus, exa for mm -hmm. example, or establishing military courts or declaring martial law, Lincoln, him Lincoln would not necessarily have agreed that his mm -hmm. actions constituted a precedent because the subsequent wars fought by the United States were not civil wars. Mm -hmm. uh, the very existence of the United States was not at stake in the Spanish-American War in World War I, even in World War II. Uh, that worldwide conflict. Even if the United States had lost that war, it didn't mean that the United States would have uh, ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. But in the case of the Civil War, at least as Lincoln perceived it, uh, the, the stakes were that great. Uh, and so, uh, yes, the end justified the means, although there were limits even on the means that Lincoln would have been willing to take. Mm -hmm. uh, the suspension of habeas corpus is a topic that has come up a lot in, in the current uh, uh, war on, on uh, terror. And, and I'm, I, I would like for you to talk a little about the, the particular kinds of situations that led uh, Lincoln in the beginning to move in this direction. Because it's really about uh, rebellious legislators meeting to make decisions that might work against his primary mm -hmm. goal. Very, very different situation in a way. Yes. Um, well, the Constitution, in its um, particularly passive voice and negative voice, uh, uh, states that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless in cases of rebellion or invasion the public interest may require it. Um, well, this was clearly a case of rebellion. And so Lincoln, very early in the war, suspended the writ of habeas corpus along the rail corridor between uh, uh, Philadelphia and Washington. And the reason he did so was because secessionists from the state of Maryland were burning bridges and tearing down telegraph lines, which cut Washington off from the rest of the North. Uh, and under that uh, suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, a man named John Merriman, who was captain of a pro-Confederate military company in Maryland and had participated in tearing down telegraph lines, was arrested and imprisoned at Fort McHen McHenry. Um, the Chief Justice, no, no lesser personage than the Chief Justice of the United States, Roger Brooke Taney, in his capacity as the superior uh, judge in the Maryland Circuit Court, issued a writ ordering Maryland's release. Uh, Lincoln refused. Taney issued a ruling saying the president does not have the constitutional right on his own authority to spend the writ. This is something only Congress can do. Lincoln disagreed. The writ stays suspended. Lincoln expanded it. Uh, all kinds of people were arrested, mostly in the border states, including in September 1861, about 27 members of the Maryland legislature uh, at a time when the Lincoln administration was afraid that they were going to vote Maryland out of the Union, uh, thus leaving the capital of the United States surrounded by enemy territory. Lincoln justified the suspension on the grounds that uh, these people were threatening the uh, survival uh, of the United States. Uh, it was one of his most controversial actions and quite frankly I think that uh, some of his subordinates uh, were over enthusiastic in, in uh, some of the people that they arrested and imprisoned for a time under what we would today call preventive detention. Uh, Lincoln, the Lincoln administration made the decision that if these people took an oath of loyalty to the United States, they would be released. Most of them eventually did. Some refused. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these Marylanders, who were clearly uh, pro-Confederate, uh, were kept in prison without trial uh, for more than a year. But most of them were eventually released. And most of the people arrested under the suspension of the writ, and for that matter, tried by military tribunals, were in the border states, which were active war zone, or even in parts of the Confederacy that had been in, uh, conquered and were occupied by Union troops. Uh, the most celebrated cases, 
though it did take place in the North, uh, and eventually re led to a Supreme Court decision after the end of the war, mm -hmm. the Milligan decision in 1866, which said that when Lincoln created military courts to try civilians in a state like Indiana, that's where the Milligan case came from, uh, that was not part of the war zone, uh, then he had gone beyond his constitutional powers. Uh, that as long as the civil courts were open, civilians had a right to be tried in civil courts, not in military courts. Lincoln, if he had lived, probably would not have agreed with that decision because uh, the basis for his uh, um, declaration of, of martial law and creation of military tribunals in 1862, which goes beyond the mere suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, was the um, assumption that the whole country was a war zone, that this was a civil war in which there were uh, Confederate sympathizers in a state like Indiana, uh, where um, trial in the civilian courts would not, uh, you know, you could never get a jury conviction because too many, uh, people, too many people there were sympathetic with the Confederacy, that this was a war uh, that was going on even in the North, uh, as well as in the actual Confederate states themselves. Uh, whether he was justified in doing that has uh, continued to be a matter of great debate among constitutional historians. I tend to come down with my sympathies on Lincoln's side in this question. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the stories, themes that runs throughout the book is Lincoln's relation with his generals. And, and it's in those relations that we see all the themes that we've really been discussing, the, his, his political astuteness about what he could do uh, uh, and uh, the, the patience for over time where he could have the support to do what he wanted to do and make his military. But, but before we get into that, it's very important to understand Lincoln, the neophyte in, in terms of military strategy, actually had a strategy through through study, and he understood what he had to do with regard to time and space if he was going to win the war. Uh, and he had trouble making his generals understand it. Tell us what that strategy was. Well, Lincoln uh, evolved, I think, through his study of um, military history and strategy, and I think his own common sense, his own sort of um, intellectual acumen. Uh, a strategy of what military historians or strategists, theorists have called the concentration in time. In order to counter the Confederacy's uh, ability to, uh, to concentrate, to use interior lines to concentrate in space. Well, what does that mean? Um, if you envisage the um, geography uh, of the Civil War, uh, the Confederate States, the 11 states that constitute the Confederate States of America, were surrounded on the north and the west by the United States, and on the south and the east by the Gulf of Mexico and the, and the Pacific, uh, and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, within that uh, the perimeters of the Confederacy, they could use what were called interior lines to shift mm -hmm. troops from one section to another if the enemy invaded. Um, uh, along a particular line. Uh, the United States Army had to use exterior lines in order to, you know, to invade the Confederacy from the outside. Lincoln came up with the idea that the Confederacy's ability to use their interior lines to concentrate troops against the most threatened point. For example, in the first major campaign of the war, when the principal United States Army uh, moved down to attack the Confederate defenders at Manassas Junction, 25 miles from Washington. Uh, the Confederates were able to shift troops from the Shenandoah Valley using their uh, rail connections to counter that Union invasion uh, and to repulse it. Uh, now Lincoln learned from that, and he learned from a subsequent situation in Kentucky, Missouri, and Tennessee, that the only way the United States Army could uh, counter the ability of the Confederates to shift troops was to, in, to uh, send forward to invade on two or more fronts simultaneously so that the Confederates couldn't shift troops from one to another. And he wrote a, f a famous uh, letter to General Halleck, who was in command in the Western Theater, uh, when Lincoln wanted Halleck and, and Buell to cooperate in simultaneous advances against the Confederate defenders in, in Tennessee and Kentucky, in which he said, uh, we have the superior numbers, the enemy has the superior facility of concentrating his forces on points of collision, we will fail unless we use our advantage 
to counter his advantage, and we should use our advantage of superior numbers to uh, advance on two or more fronts simultaneously so that he cannot shift forces from one to the other. Uh, it took a long time for his generals uh, to see, as Lincoln saw, the larger picture uh, of uh, coordinating Union advances across a front uh, as much of, uh, of a thousand miles from, from uh, the Mississippi River to, to Virginia. Uh, and it wasn't really until Lincoln got Grant in as General-in-Chief in 1864 that Grant worked out a strategy for simultaneous advance advances of uh, five Union armies so that the Confederates couldn't shift troops. And uh, that's one reason why Lincoln was so um, uh, gratified by Grant's, uh, Grant's uh, leadership as General-in-Chief when he finally got him in there in March of 1864 is because Grant came up with the same kind of strategy that Lincoln had been pressing on his generals for the past three years. And, and how do we explain the poor quality of, of the string of generals that that, uh, uh, that uh, Lincoln had in comparison to the Southern generals? Was it th the fact that the army had been so Southern? And it seems also to be the case that a lot of these generals that were inadequate were political generals. Well, yes, political generals were the people appointed by Lincoln because of their political prominence rather than their military experience or training. Uh, I argue in the book that while uh, these political generals were not particularly effective, uh, most of them as uh, military commanders, there were exceptions who, who actually turned out to be good military commanders, but some of the most prominent ones didn't, were not, that nevertheless Lincoln had appointed these political generals as part of his national strategy mm -hmm. to mobilize um, a large army as volunteers because these people had a, a large constituency, a large following. Uh, but in the case of uh, Union commanders in the Eastern Theater, starting with General McClellan, uh, followed by Burnside, Hooker, even General Meade, uh, they did not seem capable of carrying out Lincoln's um, aggressive strategy. Lincoln had come to the, uh, to the conviction that uh, the United States was not going to win this war merely by nibbling at the, around the edges of the Confederacy, merely by imposing a blockade, merely by gaining control of, of key railroad junctions or of ports, uh, that the only way that they were going to win the war was by attacking, carrying the war to the enemy, uh, trying to cripple or destroy enemy armies. Uh, and that was something that before Grant became General-in-Chief, his commanders in the Eastern Theater seemed incapable of understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on, with respect to your question about why these, why these military commanders seemed not to get it and not to be very effective, that impression comes mostly from the Virginia Theater of the War, the Eastern Theater of the War where during the first three years of the war, the Confederates were more successful, especially under the leadership of Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. And because of uh, the importance of that theater of the war and because of his problems with the generals who were in, in command in that theater of the war, Lincoln spent more of his time and energy in dealing with those problems than anything else. But at the same time, in the West, defined in those days as the Mississippi River Valley, uh, Tennessee River Valley, uh, Cumberland uh, River Valley, uh, states like Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, Arkansas, uh, the Union forces were much more successful. And it was out of this Western theater uh, that the generals who eventually won the war for the North came. Grant, Sherman, George Thomas, Sheridan, they all came out of the Western hmm. theater. Uh, and because the Eastern Theater for Lincoln was the squeaky wheel, it got most of the grease, but Lincoln himself from Illinois also was very conscious of the importance of what they called in those days the Great West, uh, basically the Mississippi River Valley and its tributaries. Uh, and he spotted Grant fairly early on uh, mm -hmm. as an effective commander in this theater. And although, uh, and, and while Grant came under a lot of criticism for uh, his being surprised at Shiloh for the uh, initial failures in his Vicksburg campaign, uh, 
Lincoln s supported Grant through thick and thin, and as I th argue in the book, that may be one of his major contributions to ultimate Union victory was his um, ability to uh, to um, uh, identify Grant's good qualities and to defend him against his critics, and eventually uh, to bring him up to the supreme command of, of Union armies. So. Um, uh, while Lincoln was dealing with frustrating problems and failures in the Eastern Theater, and because he had to spend so much of his time and energy on that, we get the impression that uh, the Union was failing in the Eastern Theater. Uh, things were going better in the Western Theater. Uh, and the one man who was more responsible for the, the successes in the Western Theater, Grant, was somebody that Lincoln had uh, identified early on and, and, and brought along and brought him east in 1864 uh, to, to turn the war around in that theater as well. Uh, putting aside uh, generals like McClellan, who, who seems to be, I think at one point you quote Lincoln as saying, you see all these soldiers around McClellan, they're his bodyguards, uh, as opposed to soldiers, because uh, 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 McClellan was re reluctant to move decisively. He always wanted more troops, more supplies, and over uh, 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 overestimated the enemy's uh, troop numbers. But there's a turning point, which I, I thought was a, a small little anecdote you had, but which was a very nice way both to show uh, Lincoln's leadership skills and on all dimensions, and also uh, the turning point here. And this was late in the war. Uh, uh, McClellan is, is reluctant to move, and Lincoln uh, overhears, or it's reported to him, that a major key in the general staff uh, had said, well, we really don't want to bag the rebel army, because that's not our game, and, and Lincoln fired him. Uh, because that hit to the core of what his goal was versus what many in the military's goal were. Yeah, that's true. This was after the Battle of Antietam in the fall of 1862, and Lincoln was very upset with McClellan for having failed to follow through on what was a limited uh, and indecisive victory. Uh, in this battle in, in Maryland, uh, which stopped Robert E. Lee's invasion of Maryland and forced him to retreat to Virginia, but did not follow up uh, and uh, tried to inflict greater damage. And uh, a major on, uh, on General Halleck's staff um, commented to one of his colleagues uh, who had asked about why McClellan didn't pursue, uh, didn't try to attack. Uh, well, that's not the game. The game is to achieve a stalemate so that we can have a negotiated peace and save slavery. Uh, and uh, when Lincoln heard that, he was incensed. Uh, he didn't really believe uh, that that was McClellan's um, purpose, although there were a lot of radical Republicans who believed it's about McClellan. That's the, that's the very edge of treason, really. Uh, and McClellan, or Lincoln called this major into his office, called him onto the carpet and asked him if he'd really said that, and the man said yes, he did, he admitted it. So to make an example of him, Lincoln fired him right away, cashiered him, uh, not just dismissed him from his post, but removed him from the United States Army. Well, it's like a dishonorable discharge, basically. Lincoln was sending a message by doing that. He was sending a message principally to McClellan, who got that message, I think, because very soon after that, uh, McClellan issued an order to his army basically saying, it's the military's purpose to carry out the policy of the civilian leadership of this government and not to make policy itself. Uh, and uh, basically, Lincoln, Lincoln um, was, even McClellan got that message, even though it didn't make any difference in his um, military aggressiveness, at least he realized that um, under the Constitution and under Lincoln's leadership, it was the President of the United States as Commander-in-Chief who was going to make the basic decisions about how this war was going to be fought and what the purpose of the war was, and not generals or even uh, officers in the Army. Mm -hmm. It was, a, it was an, you're quite right, this was an important turning point. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and another important 
important uh, uh, evolution here is uh, Lincoln's popularity with the soldiers, because one of his problems in moving against uh, McClellan, you tell us, is that McClellan was very popular among his soldiers, but by the end of the war, uh, uh, the last phase of the war, uh, when Lincoln would go visit the troops, which he did often, he was very popular. And, and this put him politically in a position to decisively move against McClellan as inadequate for the command that he held. Yes. Um, I th people often ask me why Lincoln didn't fire McClellan earlier uh, than November 1862, which was when he finally removed him from command. And I think there are two reasons for that. Um, one is that McClellan had a very strong constituency in the North. He was supported by the Democratic Party and by conservative, some conservative Republicans and by newspapers like the New York Herald, which was the largest newspaper in the United States. Uh, but secondly, and probably more important, McClellan had a powerful constituency in the Army itself. He had created its officer corps and he was amazingly popular among the rank and file of soldiers themselves who tended not to blame Lincoln for McClellan's failures, but to bl blame Secretary of War Stanton, to blame the Republicans in Congress. And when Lincoln visited the army, he would talk with the soldiers as man to man. He did not uh, uh, talk down to them. Uh, he was not like their officers who uh, you know, f felt that they were way above the soldiers. He had a kind of rapport with the common soldiers. Uh, and so he was popular with them. And I think a key uh, experience that, uh, that Lincoln had was after the Battle of Antietam, in the first four days of October 1862, uh, he went up to uh, the, Antietam, the area where that battle had been fought near Sharpsburg, Maryland, uh, and spent four days with the army. Uh, and he saw that he was popular with the soldiers. They cheered him. Uh, he talked with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and I think that gave him confidence that if McClellan did not measure up to his expectations to carry out an aggressive campaign after Antietam, uh, he was going to replace him and that he could do so without the danger of a mutiny. Uh, and as the war went on, Lincoln be grew more and more popular with the soldiers. He visited soldiers in the hospital. He was famous for commuting the sentences of soldiers who had been court-martialed for uh, sleeping on duty or for going AWOL or something like that. Uh, so there was a kind of um, rapport. And when Lincoln <coughs> ran for re-election in 1864, who is his Democratic opponent? None other than General mm -hmm. George B. McClellan. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons the Democrats had nominated McClellan was their expectation that he would get the soldier vote. Well, as it turned out, mm -hmm. Lincoln got the overwhelming majority of soldier votes. Seventy-eight percent of the soldiers voted for McClellan, uh, for Lincoln, uh, only 22 percent for McClellan. Uh, and that was a much larger percentage than Lincoln got of the civilian vote. So that was the proof of Lincoln's popularity among the soldiers, uh, much greater popularity than uh, the old commander of the Army of the Potomac who once had been so popular with his men. In, in the end of, towards the end of the war, Lincoln's uh, vision of his in-state but also his sense of politics gave him a very fine understanding of how he had to handle politically whatever peace initiatives were occurring. Because in, in the same way that the military didn't want to go all the way, some people wanted to uh, negotiate a peace to end the conflict, but then that would have undermined uh, Lincoln's national goal. Yes, uh, in the summer of 1864, when the war seemed to be going badly for the North, uh, especially in Virginia, where uh, Grant had launched what came to be called his Overland Campaign with, uh, with such public expectation that uh, he would, this heavy hitter would win the war by the 4th of July. Uh, but instead, Union forces on all fronts seemed to be bogged down by the 4th of July after such enormous casualties, especially in Virginia, that a wave of defeatism and of war weariness, of uh, desire for peace uh, came over the northern people. Uh, it looked like this war would have no end. Uh, and Lincoln really had to deal with that. Uh, and there were a couple of initiatives, one of them by the editor of the most powerful Republican newspaper, Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune, uh, 
uh, to meet with Confederate envoys uh, to to negotiate some kind of an end, uh, a ceasefire, an armistice, uh, to try to bring this this cruel war, which was killing so many young men, to to an end. Uh, and Lincoln had to uh, walk through this minefield of. On the one hand, a realization that an appeal for that, that, that uh, appeal by the United States government for a ceasefire and negotiation to end this war would be tantamount to a Confederate victory, uh, just as the German appeal f 50 years later in 1918 for an armistice was tantamount to an Allied victory in that war. Lincoln saw that this would be the same. But at the same time, uh, he had to appear to be open to the possibility of peace negotiations to end this killing. So he, um, uh, he very successfully, I think, um, said that he'd be willing to meet with any representative of Jefferson Davis for a peace negotiation on the preconditions of restoration of the Union and, as he put it, abandonment of slavery. Uh, this abandonment of slavery condition became uh, very controversial because it appeared to um, uh, undermine any chances for negotiation. And uh, this was also happening at a time when the uh, presidential election of 1864 was approaching. This is in August of 1864. And Lincoln was convinced that uh, if the election had been held then, or if things continued to go badly, uh, that he would be defeated for re-election. Uh, nevertheless, he uh, refused to abandon his conditions, his preconditions of union and emancipation for any negotiations. Uh, and if things had not improved on the military front, uh, he might well have been defeated for re-election, and who knows what would have happened then. But in the nick of time, one might say, to, to save Lincoln's prospects, and basically, I think, to save the prospects of, of, of victory in this war, uh, Sherman captured Atlanta, General Sheridan won some uh, impressive victories in the Shenandoah Valley, Admiral Farragut um, dammed the torpedoes and uh, took the United States Navy into Mobile Bay and closed off one of the last ports for blockade running. Uh, and Lincoln was triumphantly reelected, but he had uh, he had stuck with his conditions. Uh, he had walked that tightrope between um, uh, giving up the war, uh, but also seem, seeming to be open to the possibilities of negotiation to end it, end the war, but on his own terms, very successfully. However, if it hadn't been for military victories in the field, uh, we might now look back on Lincoln as a failed commander-in-chief. It was that close. One, one final question, and we have only a few minutes left. Uh, how would you like, how, how as a historian, do you think historical insights like those in this book can inform sort of policy and action today by our presidents as, as well, let's say our president-elect as he confronts two ongoing wars? Well, I th I'm often asked about the lessons of history, and especially the lessons of uh, this, this part of our history. And I think like most historians, I'm a little bit leery of, uh, of saying, okay, here is the lesson from this that which we should draw on today. I think that uh, our, our leaders today have to be knowledgeable about history, they have to be informed about history, they can learn from studying history, but they shouldn't necessarily follow a kind of lockstep mm -hmm. uh, lessons of history uh, format because the situation today is different from what it was then. But I think that uh, the, the story of Lincoln's role as a commander in chief uh, combines uh, two qualities that would be useful for any commander in chief or any leader today. One, a uh, kind of inflexible commitment to uh, a principle or to a central policy in Lincoln's case, preservation of the United States, combined with flexibility in means, uh, a willingness to be open to trying something different in the way of national strategy or military strategy if what you're trying isn't working. In Lincoln's case, for example, moving a national strategy from a policy of not touching slavery to a policy of, um, of emancipation as a means of uh, mobilizing, uh, uh, weakening the enemy and strengthening your own side. Uh, 
And in military strategy of moving from, for example, a policy of merely invading and occupying places to one of trying to destroy enemy armies. So a combination of inflexibility in principle and flexibility in means is, I think, probably the lesson that we can learn from Lincoln as Commander-in-Chief. Well, on that note, Professor McPherson, I want to thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you for writing the book. I will show the book again. Thank you, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.